Welcome back to Pain and Comfort. This is going to be our last presentation, I promise you that. Um, when we talk about invasive techniques for chronic pain, um, we, we utilize those uh, when drugs or other methods are not effective. And the idea behind the invasive techniques is that we want to interrupt the pain pathways um, when pain is intractable or not able to be relieved or if it is severely debilitating. Um, so depending on the technique, um, there is some degree of neurologic deficit and nerve destruction. So we try to utilize these um, as a last resort and end, function, or end choice for our, our patients with pain management needs. So as you can see on this, um, letter A is a implantable pump and then B are the spinal catheters that deliver the precise volume of a long-term intraspinal analgesic every day. So you might see these being utilized. This um, spinal cord stimul stimulator offers kind of a more invasive method of nerve stimulation. We see it being used more and more um, and the amount of electrical current is adjusted to provide pain relief without additional discomforts. Um, so it's not like you're going to go put your hand on the electric um, fence and then run the risk of getting electrocuted, say, um, because we know that there's a little kickback and um, that causes the pain. With this, there's just an amount of electrical current and then they are able to adjust that up or down to achieve pain uh, management. With the um, long-term intraspinal analgesics, that works very much just like an intrathecal epidural spinal anesthetic. However, it's not going to deliver so much that the patient isn't going to be able to walk. With our community-based care, um, it's important to remember that pain is going to extend beyond that hospitalization period and really a lot of times patients with chronic pain aren't hospitalized. Uh, they utilize medications at home, they come in when necessary, maybe we have some ER visits. So the idea behind community-based care is to ensure patients are using their pain medications and pain management as prescribed that they keep their follow-up visits um, and then just coordinating care to c have continued pain management be um, until they are discharged from the community care. With home care management, um, it's usually the nurse who is the case manager, uh, a d an occupational therapist, physical therapist, um, physicians, they're going to play a big role in um, home management and taking care of the patients at home. Um, home infusion therapy does prov provide a wide variety of services to our patients and oftentimes they do have to have insurance approval before um, these type of analgesics are going to be offered. So it is always least invasive to most invasive. For self-management, the patient and the family need to know about the analgesic regimens. Um, they need to understand how to work the machines to deliver the analgesia, what the purpose is, how the drugs work, what the side effects are, and remember all those complications. The family and patient need to be educated on those as well. So we need to make sure that we have adequate discharge teaching so that once they go home they are able to care for themselves at home. So we need to evaluate what type of support the client has prior to going home and then see what the support systems are. Maybe it's somebody that has good support and it's, or it could be the other end that they don't have that support that's necessary. So we need to um, determine what their coping strategies are going to be, what type of support they have. There are a number of healthcare resources that are out there. Um, with those they're going to be related and specific to the patient's physical condition, what their level of activity is. Oftentimes, um, just dealing with the anxiety of going home with new medications or with pumps are going to play a role in that. So we need to make sure we have close relationships and that there is a network of support available to our patients for ongoing effective pain intervention strategies. If we, oftentimes patients will have, um, maybe be seen in a pl pain clinic, and if that is the case, then they have to follow the plan of care that is set up by that clinic. 
So with pain, as you can see by this handout, there's lots of different things that go on when we are talking about pain and taking care of our patients with pain. Um, so bring this to class and we're going to discuss this more in depth as well. The last thing we need to touch upon is fibromyalgia syndrome. Fibromyalgia is a chronic uh, pain syndrome and is not an inflammatory disease. Specifically, the patient has um, specific um, areas of tenderness. They're called uh, tender points. Um, they are typically in the neck, upper chest, the low back, and maybe some of the extremities. Fibromyalgia is very difficult to diagnose because there isn't a specific marker. There's not a lab test that can be done to diagnose fibromyalgia. So oftentimes the patients really get um, upset, depressed, angry, um, because they know that something's wrong, but nobody can figure out what is wrong with them. So diagnosing fibro fibromyalgia is a very... When you look at the pathophysiology of fibromyalgia, you can see that really some of the pre-existing factors is that there is interruption with serotonin receptors as well as endorphins. And some of the things that predispose that are going to be um, like a muscle um, trauma but at the micro level so it's not anything that we can see we can't visualize it we can't x-ray it um, it's just not showing up on like MRI CT any of those types of things um, and then what happens is those symptoms worsen um, because of um, sleep disturbances and so we know that when we're tired it seems like everything snowballs you know I think about my kids and when my daughter gets tired you know the whole world is absolutely falling apart so we all know that it's really important to get sleep so that we have time to heal and we get that rest so that we are able to have better coping strategies so as this uh, kind of snowballs then the patient will have pain and fatigue oftentimes depression and then they have um, hyperactivity at the um, subcutaneous or derma um, derma level so their skin is hyperactive um, and then they will see that there is um, increased uh, cutaneous nociception so that means that the um, nociception is normal pain at this at the derma or the skin layer there is an increased sympathetic outflow and there's increased muscle nociception so that's causing all these things to have increased pain well while that's happening we're having decreased serotonin decrease of endorphins and then an increase in substance P so you can kind of see that it sort of has a snowball effect um, and there's lots of different things going on but we can't just take a blood test and determine that all of this is going on so really it's a process of elimination to have a diagnosis of fibromyalgia um, it's typically the patient complains of severe fatigue and it's lasting longer than six months so you know when you think about you folks as nursing students yes I know that you're tired um, if you're a mother and a student a father and a student you're tired if you're working and a student it makes you more tired but you know that at the end of the nursing program you're going to be able to get hopefully be able to get some sleep get some rest and kind of catch up on things um, there are four or more criteria must be met um, for chronic fatigue syndrome diagnosis. So with that, if you take a look on page 354 of uh, your medical surgical nursing Iggy book, you'll see that these, there's a bunch of criteria listed. Um, sore throat, substantial impairment in the short-term memory or decreased concentration, tender lymph nodes, muscle pain, multiple joint and pain with redness or swelling, headaches of a new type, pattern or severity, something that's different than what the patient normally experiences, um, and then unrefreshing, unrefreshing sleep. So you can see that there's a vast array of symptoms, but if the patient has four of these criteria, then the diagnosis of fatigue syndrome uh, can be made. It is more common in women and is not limited to any specific socioeconomic group or age. And as I said, there's no laboratory test to confirm the diagnosis, so it's a process of elimination which is very tedious, time-consuming, and exhausting to our patients. Um, for treatment, typically what we see for treatment, it's just going to be supportive. It's going to focus on alleviating the um, patient's complaints or symptoms. Uh, the NSAIDs may help with the body aches. Antidepressants may help um, promote sleep 
and it will help prevent or treat the um, undiagnosed or untreated depression. We want to make sure that the patient gets adequate sleep. So someone that has chronic fatigue syndrome, working a night shift isn't going to be very possible for them. Some of the complementary therapies like acupuncture, um, tai chi, massage, herbal supplements, all of those things are going to be really important for this patient. So I'm going to stop here. We have eye clicker questions at the end of this presentation. However, we will talk about those in class. Um, I thank you very much and we will see you uh, the next time you're in class.